Hey there, I'm Drew, and you are watching or maybe just listening to The Anxious Truth. The Anxious Truth is the podcast that talks about all things anxiety, anxiety disorders, and recovery. So if you're struggling with things like panic disorder, panic attacks, agoraphobia, or OCD, well, this is the place for you. Today, we have a special guest on, my friend Josh Fletcher, Anxiety Josh, as some of you may know him, and we're going to talk about what happens when anxiety becomes part of your recovery. So grab a cup of coffee or a cup of tea, and let's talk about that. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Anxious Truth. This is podcast episode number 235, recording the beginning of November of 2022. I believe you're going to see this right after Thanksgiving of 2022. If you're watching from the future, hello, future. So today we have a guest on, my friend and frequent guest and collaborator, Joshua Fletcher. Josh is a psychotherapist from the UK, otherwise known as Anxiety Josh on the internet. Uh, he's written books. He has a great podcast himself called The Panic Pod. And today we're going to talk about what happens when anxiety becomes part of your identity. Because that can happen to people who are trapped in disordered anxiety or who are on the recovery journey. It's a really great discussion. I think you're going to dig it. Before we get into that, just a quick reminder that The Anxious Truth is more than just this podcast episode or this video. All of the things I have to offer for all of you guys are on my website at theanxioustruth.com. That includes three books that I've written on anxiety and anxiety recovery, the rest of the podcast episodes, which are all free, a free one-hour Anxiety 101 recovery video training that's on my YouTube channel. That's linked on my website. There's a monthly seminar, webinar I do with my friend Joanna Hardis on the art of learning how to tolerate distress, which is such a big part of recovery. Uh, there's the morning newsletter called The Anxious Morning, all the social media stuff. There's just a ton of great resources on my website, theanxioustruth.com. Go check it out. And if you are following my work, it's helping you, and you would like to find a way to support it, all the ways you can do that can be found at theanxioustruth.com slash support. Never required, always appreciated. I appreciate all of you guys and all the encouragement and all the support that I get all the time for this work that I do. Okay, let's get to it. Today, we're going to talk with Josh Fletcher about what happens when anxiety becomes part of your recovery. Uh, we think we went on for about 30 minutes or so. It's a nice short episode. Uh, and then I will come back at the end to wrap it up, give you links, places to go, resources to check out. See you afterwards. All right, folks, as promised, on screen with me, Josh Fletcher from the UK, frequent collaborator, friend, guest. What's up, brother? Hi, Drew. Um, yeah, I'm doing all right. We were just uh, discussing before the episode how much my mic sounds better than your mic, and, and that's yeah. that's basically going to be the whole episode. Just about, yeah. yeah, you guys better strap in. There's going to be two guys just making microphone jokes for 20 minutes. <laughs> we might not get to any mental health, but you'll enjoy the mic stuff, I know. Yeah, uh, or if you're into ASMR, we could do some of that as well. Yeah, we could totally do that. <laughs> The um, So today we're going to talk about the idea, and I'm going to get right into this because you said we would address the hypocrisy straight out of the gate. So I'm going to put this up on the screen because for those of you who do not know Josh, which I bet you do, you look at the bottom of the screen here, you'll see that Josh is affectionately known as Anxiety Josh. And today we're talking about when anxiety becomes your identity. So, oh, the irony. Yeah, there's, there's a huge amount of uh, double standards and hypocrisy here. Um yeah, I wanted to talk about the subject with you, Drew, because it's, I know it's something we've kind of spoke about sporadically in the past. Mm -hmm. And it's I want to look at the relationship that you have with with anxiety as a whole. You know, most people have, um, particularly with anxiety disorders, it's it's consuming. Like some many people have been kind of battling or living with it for years, and it almost kind of steals a part of your identity. Um, but also people going through it and going through the very lonely, scary place that is going through an anxiety disorder. Along the way, you get to meet some people um, in, in the community, in your community, and you know, a lot of our communities shared. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you find some camaraderie in that community, and, and you find a purpose, and that's wonderful. For me, though, I just wanted to talk about kind of this, when anxiety becomes part of your identity, in relation to recovery, um, because I remember for many years I would, you know, I've got a shine, I've got a word for what I'm going through. It's an anxiety disorder, it's panic disorder. I've got obsessive compulsive disorder. You know, yes, I have this thing, and and yeah, initially it's fantastic to have a have a name and a label for it. Um, but then I've noticed, like, well, particularly for me, many years ago, stuff like that. As I was trying to go through recovery, it became a more of a a reminder to my identity. It was me. It was always 
while I'm in groups talking about anxiety. I've got bookshelves full of anxiety. I've got journals and blogs all about anxiety. And it gets to a point where that actually isn't helpful. You see it on social media. And again, this is where the hypocrisy is. You know, you and I do social media, but we are still part of that world of anxiety recovery. But for me, you, if you, like, not full recovery, it's a vague term, but you know, you're in a really good place mm. when you see stuff like mine and Drew's and you're like, oh, those guys are great, but I've got a life to live right now. That's what I was trying to uh, say. And I think, you know, this is my job and I do this and I have boundaries. And when I'm not doing this podcast or seeing clients or whatever, I, I get on with my life. I'm not really thinking about anxiety, not thinking about anxiety recovery. You know, I have that boundary. And I suppose we'll talk about that as well today, Drew. But it's about yep. that relationship was when I think if anxiety has become your entire identity um, or a big part of it, then take this episode as an opportunity to reflect and realize actually maybe I am just absorbed too much in this anxiety sphere, this wider anxiety sphere at the moment. Does that make sense? I hope it doesn't come across as positive. No, no, no. I think it, it's really helpful to talk about that. And it does make a lot of sense. It's one of the things I think that's interesting. We could acknowledge that sometimes is a difficult issue for people to, to even identify or confront. I know I get asked all the time. You probably get this question too. Doesn't being involved in this all the time affect you? Like, doesn't it make you anxious? Well, no, because even though we might, or I can, I'll speak for myself, even though I might be involved in this so many hours a day in this topic, it's not a part of who I am anymore because I've reached that place. So I know it doesn't, but for many people, they just assume if you are reading about it all the day, all I do is write about it. I talk into microphones about it. I make videos about it. Doesn't it make you anxious? No, it doesn't because it's not, anxiety is not part of who I am anymore. The disorder part isn't. So I think people mm. even fail to even see what's happened there. Like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, wait a minute. This is a big part of who I am right now. I've attached mm. myself to it as part of my identity. So I think it's a good yeah. conversation to have. I don't think it's accusatory. I don't think it's, I don't think it's a bad thing. Nobody's doing anything wrong. It's just, no, yeah, no. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's just a relationship with it. I think with, for you and I, who've been through the, you know, a lot of the recovery process, a lot of it was kind of on our own, wasn't it? My, my most of my recovery is pretty much on my own. And mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't fortunate enough to have this, this, this wider community of things. Mm -hmm. Um, but at the same time that does come with its own kind of, merits because it was like because i did it on my own that was it it was a very kind of stripped back direct very simplified test don't get me wrong overcoming anxiety is not simple mm -hmm. it, it takes a lot of courage but in general the end goal was quite simple it wasn't convoluted with daily reminders from let's say if i'm in whatsapp groups or facebook groups like you and mm -hmm. i have or whatever it's I didn't have that daily reminder that there was something to fix. It was just, I need to just get on with this and I can readdress it when I can and when I want. Yeah. Um, and both, it, I almost see it like there's two little islands and there's an under, and there's an undersea tunnel. You can get to that island. Recovery is going under the undersea tunnel and coming out on Recovery Island. Mm. Uh, but you don't really see the person going into the tunnel and coming out. And that's the kind of like a boundary. So on Recovery Island, you look back and be like, hey, guys, you can come over here. And I love talking about anxiety from over here. Yeah, because I've I've been through the tunnel. I, I know what that tunnel's like. It's dark. It's scary. It's uncertain. It seems never ending. But actually, I'm going to tell you loads about this tunnel because I'm here now. I'm on Recovery Island. It's OK. It doesn't affect me. Right. But what I'm going to tell you is that you've got to go in that tunnel on your own and go through it. And then you can talk about it from this side. And that's okay. I know people, some people do that. Some people go through stressful things and turn it into, they, they so passionate about it that they turn it into their profession, their job, they write about it, whatever, a bit like sure. what you and I have done. But when you're in recovery, just be careful to have those boundaries and to be like, I've had just a lot of anxiety content today. Part of recovery is getting on with your, with your life as well outside of anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you have a different relationship with it when you get, I like recovery Island. I, I, I kind of dig that when you get to the Island, the recovery Island, then you, your relationship with the content is different. Also, it's not triggering. It's not any of those things. No, you I don't think, get triggered on recovery. Yeah. Well, you can get triggered on recovery. Can, you don't care. Can. Well, I think the trigger is yeah. a little bit different for people like you and me. It's not so much, Oh, my panic has been triggered or anything like that, but 
you know, it's, it's demanding in its own way. It's just not demanding in a disordered kind of way. And I, I yeah. think one of the things that you mentioned, which is interesting is, you know, you had to go through kind of on your own, you know, we didn't have the benefit of maybe the communities that you and I have now, which is true. And in a way that means that when I was recovering, I was out here in like the disordered zone sort of on my own. I mean, yes, I made friends and I wouldn't be behind this mic if it wasn't for the friends that I made online in those days, but it was a very small number of people, very small. Yeah. But so you're out there like in the disordered zone on your own and you're trying to get, I'm trying to get back with the rest of everybody else. Well, we call it social media for a reason. So you can be a part of groups of hundreds or thousands of people who are like you every minute of every day. And in a way, I know we use the word normalize a lot and maybe overuse it. I know, yeah. Social media. Normalize but, this. Yes, yeah. but in some ways, the, the social aspect of this means your recovery gets socialized to a certain extent and you become part of this group that normalizes, this is hard, this is scary, this is difficult, nobody knows. So it can be really easy to just take on the persona of the group, which is, mm. hey, everybody's, you know, this is too scary for me. And everybody else in the mm. group, it's scary for them too. And they agree. And yeah, I understand how that feels. It's terrible. So mm. it's easy in that way. You almost accidentally take on the, uh, the persona of an anxious, in, in air quotes, incapable person because of the persona of the group, the social group. This week's episode of The Anxious Truth has a real life sponsor for the very first time in the history of this podcast. The coolest thing is it has nothing to do with anxiety, recovery, or mental health. So it's not some sort of crackpot cure because I would never do that to you guys. Today's episode of the podcast is sponsored by mylifeinabook.com. It's just a cool, thoughtful service that I thought was useful and I thought you might too. This might be the most thoughtful gift I've ever seen for parents and grandparents, older members of our family, especially as the winter holidays approach and we get together to celebrate, it's a really powerful way to connect an emotional level with the older members of our family and to start to preserve their most precious memories, show them that we really care. Best of all, it's an instantaneous gift. I've tried it with my mom. She's really digging it. She's having a good time with it. And every week, mylifeinabook.com lets us choose from a list of really thought-provoking questions or we can write our own those get emailed to our relatives, they can answer those questions, and they can even attach meaningful pictures and images to their answers. This happens once a week, and at the end of one year, those stories are compiled and combined into a really high-quality, beautiful, keepsake book that can preserve and store our relatives' memories and be passed down from generation to generation. You can request as many copies of the book as you would like. You can even get the book in audio format, which I think is a really cool feature. And with mylifeinabook.com, you can give those you love a really a most precious gift that lets them know that they're meaningful not only to you, but the generations that come after you. To save $10 off your first purchase, use discount code TAT22. That's TAT22 to get $10 off at mylifeinabook.com. And thank you to mylifeinabook.com for sponsoring The Anxious Truth, being our first sponsor and supporting the work that we do here. Yes, yes, I, I, I... Do you know what inspired me to want to talk about this as well? It's like I was trying to imagine my own recovery in the age of social media, and I mean, don't know, there was social media, but it wasn't like you know I did, yeah. didn't have Instagram, and there wasn't this huge wellness fear back then. And I, I also think that often having the daily minute reminders during leisure time mm -hmm. can often be unhealthy. So. You know, if you look, if you, it depends on your relationship with social media, but if you say, you know, if you have Instagram and your entire feed is just anxiety help related, right? you're almost reinforcing something in your brain there that actually anxiety is this big thing that needs to be fixed. And also you'll be getting drip fed kind of reassurance during all that. Oh, there's other people like me and mm -hmm. we all suffer and struggle and it's okay and that's okay you know in, in the short run that's okay it's like yeah it's good to feel not alone you aren't alone and if you're listening now and you're feeling lonely and isolated you're not alone there's millions of people that struggle um, even if it, with your specific anxiety there are so many people that kind of deal with that as well you're not alone right but i often think that it can you know when i say it's part of your identity you know if you've got 20 minutes of free time at home and you're scrolling through your phone often we can define ourselves through um what is kind of our what we do in our free time so in my free time i like to write read listen to books um run play football see friends i love music 
mm. and I often create and, and, and enjoy what is my my identity in my free time. But if you're trying and you're getting somewhere and you're almost there out of like anxious recovery, and in your free time you're filling it with just anxiety related content, it's starting to become your identity. Yeah, you know. Yeah. And 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 don't get me wrong, Drew and I love talking about and uh, the latest research, stuff like that, different ideas, because we really enjoy it. It is part of our identity. It's all right. But also importantly, we have our lives as well. And some, and there are days where I'm like, I can't be bothered talking about anxiety anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think it's different when you look at like, well, it becomes part of, for me, it's becoming part of my professional identity. Yeah. And that's part of your overall identity. That's true. You can't separate that, but it's not my personal identity. And it's, it's interesting because, I mean, I kid you a little bit about using the, the moniker Anxiety Josh, but for four or five years, the first four or five years of this podcast, it was called That Anxiety Guy. And I hated that, but I was literally, so I was in the same boat. I can't, I had to like uh, plead guilty to that before I changed the name of the podcast, you know, That Anxiety Guy. But I didn't want to be That Anxiety Guy. There was something about that that I didn't like. So in the end, there were other practical reasons why we changed, but also it felt good to not call myself that anymore. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but. Yeah, of course. And yeah, like, I've literally called anxiety Josh. And that's part of my, yeah, like that. It's my professional identity. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, if I want, here's, here's a way to do it. If I go on holiday for two weeks, I don't, my professional anxiety Josh dies. Right. It's just Josh. You know, it's Josh Fletcher. And he's mm -hmm. doing his own thing. Um, I even have boundaries with kind of talking about it, things, things like that, because if you're trying to recover from anxiety, you need to show, and this is not why my opinion, mm -hmm. which is basically fact. And <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> it's, not stop it's, it's, it's just my opinion, but like anxiety, disordered anxiety disappears when you teach it, it's not important. And what Correct. are you doing in the moments when you are even reading it, even when you're on your 50th self-help book mm -hmm. about anxiety, on some level, you're still teaching it that it's important. Yeah. Uh, whereas if you're like, you know what, I'm just going to go and play tennis with my friend. I can't even play tennis, but it's better than sitting here and reading yet another self-help book about that to fix the anxiety, the journey, something to mm -hmm. share with my friends in the group. I, sound, I know I sound really grumpy and misanthropic here. No. It's just a take. It's just a take on it. Yeah. You know, I might want to listen to one of Josh's podcasts. Uh, I can't believe we're doing a podcast about try not to listen to my podcast <laughs> yeah I, no. I literally did a podcast episode about how this podcast should not be listened to i don't know maybe a couple months ago <laughs> yeah. and somebody in my facebook group asked can the podcast become a crutch and i'm like oh the irony i'm going to link you to listen to a podcast about not listening to the podcast yes oh wow that's like meta i was so like paradox yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It exploded. yeah. yeah it, 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 and again it just comes down to your relationship with anxiety it's okay like for me, I, I, I still like looking at other people's content and their takes on it and stuff like that and mental health in general. I look at other yeah. psychotherapists and stuff, and that's great. But then I have that boundary to be like, well, that, that's probably an, that's probably a, enough anxiety content today. What would non-anxious me do? I know I've said this before, and I repeat a lot, but you know, my two golden rules, what would non-anxious me be doing? Yeah. And am I teaching the brain that disordered anxiety is not important? Not important. If you can yeah. do those things, that's fine. Um, and it just depends what kind of mood you're in. Like sometimes you might be like, I'm feeling great. Um, I want to listen to The Anxious Truth just to see his, list, his latest episode, what he's talking about now, mm -hmm. as opposed to, oh, no, I still need to recover. I need to listen to Josh's podcast for the sixth time. Right. So, like, yeah, yeah. Well, then it's now becoming a sim. It's assimilating as part of your identity. The fixing has become your identity. And it's, it's very important to separate. Like, you, know, you are more than that. There is a you there, and I want to know about it. When I have clients in here, I have the first rule is like, just come off all those groups, please. Yeah, I'm here now. You're talking yeah. to the OG. You don't need all that stuff. But, um, <laughs> the, uh, the OG. <laughs> That's true. And you know, sometimes though, and it can be difficult again to acknowledge. Like sometimes we don't even realize we're doing it. I remember in the early days, and again, I had a small group of friends on YouTube, and that was the genesis of all of this stuff that I do now. And I remember my friend Billy in the UK from Anxiety United. Billy doesn't really make anxiety videos anymore. He made a video that, you know, six of us saw because we just somehow we randomly connected and we would share videos that way. And he was literally just looking to the camera, refreshing his YouTube on camera. Somebody please post a video. And then the light bulb moment of, wait a minute, why am I sitting here waiting 
hoping that one of my six friends will post a video about their anxiety, I could, should probably go do something, which was about a, the birth of the anxious truth. Well, that was part of it. I mean, you know, that little group that I was involved with, I, I started by just saying, well, I felt like they helped me so much. We just support each other. I got to pay it forward. But that was an, I never forget him looking into the camera, like someone post a video, someone, and he was literally refreshing YouTube while he was filming himself, refreshing his YouTube feed. Oh. There was only, there was only six of us. I mean, you know, or eight wow. of us in the little group at the time. So the odds that somebody was going to post a video in that 45 seconds was very small. But then he had a moment where it was, he said, you know, like, maybe I should just turn this off and go and try something. Yeah. And I think it's important to understand that a lot of times if you're going to notice like, oh, yeah, I'm making a part of my identity. What do I do? Sometimes you just have to try other things, even though you don't feel like you can do them or you don't feel like you even know if you want to do them or am I even going to like this? Do I like this? I don't know what else to do. Trying it, just trying things is a good way to go. Yeah. Awesome. Try a different book, try different music, eat a different yeah. food. Yeah. Who are, who are you away from the anxiety? I was going to ask you, you must speak to many people, Drew, about like, at a more kind of deeper level, it's like, it, it's the cornerstone of, of, of avoidance yeah. as well. And that's when you know it's been cemented in your identity. I can't go to the party because I am an anxious person. Right. Or are you? We're all anxious people. Yeah, okay. Some people are more sensitive to that than others, and that's okay. Yeah. That's a strength. But when you start to use oh, I'm an anxious person to avoid things. I find that scary as well. Like, no, no, you, you've defined yourself as an anxious person, or maybe some people around you have called you an anxious person. Mm -hmm. But we're all anxious people. It doesn't mean you can do stuff whilst anxious. You yeah. know? And also, you don't need to have that level. You can, you can change that to, no, I'm a sensitive person. Yeah. And sensitivity is great. I'm, I'm a person that is experiencing anxiety from time to time. Oh, wait, it's not this mug. I have the... I'm experiencing variable states of transient discomfort. Like no, no one buys that mug because it's so geeky. I really want Let's, that mug. I will, I will send you one for sure. Or a t-shirt. Yeah, I, a, I, I know you need a t-shirt with it, but I'm experiencing transient states of variable discomfort as opposed to I'm anxious or I'm afraid. Like I think I think I want that on a t-shirt. Yeah, so, but, it's, yeah, yeah. but you have to be willing to put a leap of faith into that, which like, you know, okay, you're not an anxious person. You're a person who sometimes experiences states of discomfort and fear and uncertainty and all those things. But I can do stuff while I feel that. I do speak to this a lot. And in the last couple of weeks in my morning newsletter, I wrote about it. Sometimes people are afraid to recover. We can talk about this. It becomes part of their identity because in many ways, and this sometimes sounds very accusatory. I don't mean it that way. This is just an observation. If we get better. Well, if I'm not an anxious person anymore, then I have to show up in life. And that can be scary. That's not, that's scary. I get that. It's scary for everybody. It's not scary just for anxious people. So don't feel bad if you're worried about that. Yeah. But then I have to actually do things. I don't have my excuse anymore. Yeah. You know, and you could go back to, that's that whole, we were talking about the whole Adlerian thing. Like we develop anxiety disorders to mask our, our insufficiencies and to make excuses. And I'm like, really dude, really? Okay. Yeah. But, and on the other he's side, at one end of the spectrum. Um, oh, he's yeah, a very of, far of, end of the spectrum of, of theories of anxiety yeah. disorder. Yeah. I actually yeah. mentioned it when I wrote about that being afraid because your excuses get left behind. But then on the flip side, it's that identity thing. Who am I? And who am I is a big question for anybody, disordered anxiety or not. And I think you can't help but encounter a little bit of recovery identity crisis at various points along the way of this journey. It happens to all of us. Everybody's yeah. normal. I yeah. hear that a lot from clients, you know, like, I'm scared. I, what do I don't, I've been anxious for so long. What do I do? Yeah. When I'm not yeah. anxious, I'm like, that can be a fun thing. You don't need to know. You can trial and error. I've had some, some brilliant clients in here in the past. Where it's like where they've got to that stage of like shifting from like, I've really, I, I'm really buying into this, this message that I don't have to be mm -hmm. known as an anxious person. And I'm living like a non-anxious person. And if anxiety comes up, I'm willing, willing to willfully tolerate or, as you say, surrender to it mm -hmm. because I don't, I don't want that to be anymore. And so in here we've had like, like, well, let's write down a load of things that you might like, you know, yeah. and it's really funny. Like, okay, I want to try salsa dancing. And I'm like, brilliant, just go and find out. And some people are like, I actually really enjoyed salsa dancing. And other people are like, that was the worst thing I've ever done. And I'm like, but well done for going. Yeah. Let's and try something else. Life right. drawing. 
right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Li- life drawing with Drew Lentz a lot. <laughs> oh, God. The, it's so funny because uh, I can relay. I didn't really have a therapist in my recovery. I had a therapist early on. And, and believe it or not, oh, the irony, she was not an anxiety specialist. She was a clinical social worker, but she was lovely. And we connected. We talked about this, right? That therapeutic alliance. It was great. She was so helpful for a few months for me. And she let me set the agenda and she just went along with the ride for me. And, and I, I loved her. She was great. And I remember near the end, sitting in my office here at the house with n- not feeling anxious. And I literally called her that whole like, hey, you got time for a one off here? You got time for a session? And I said, I don't know what to do. And she's like, how about you go to Starbucks? And I'm like, I don't man, know what to do. There? Right. Like, what, <laughs> what do you mean go to Starbucks? She goes, go to Starbucks, grab a coffee, sit there, read a book, you know, do your work, bring your laptop. Like, I don't know. Do that. Yeah. Listen to oh, the music. Yeah. It's and I'm so, like, that's a thing. She had to tell me to go to Starbucks. And would you agree? It's because anxiety was part of your identity. The anxiety recovery 100%. was part of your identity. So Same. that those other what experiences were just written out of my my repertoire. I did not yeah. ex- I did not recognize those as valid experiences. She was like, "Do that. How about you go to a movie?" You've never, you've never told me that before. It's really just like your therapist, like, "Oh, just just do like." What do you think not anxious you yeah. would do? Just go and yeah, yeah. go to a movie. Do something like go, like that. go to the mall, walk through the mall. Like, is there a park nearby? Just go to the park. And I'm like, are those are things I literally, <laughs> have to, literally have to think about that and say, oh yeah, that seems so trivial and ridiculous. Like, I think I I thought that when my identity as an anxious person went away, that it would involve traveling the world and going on cruises and climbing mountains and running marathons. No, it, it involves going to Starbucks or like no, going and buying milk. It's the things stuff. in between the events. Yes, that's so yes. important. It's so important. It's the little menial things. Yeah, you know, you go on social media and there's people like, you know, paragliding, you know, yeah, whatever. Whatever. Uh, yeah, what I'm not interested in. That. It's the little yeah. things that that you do as you. And it's so important. Um I and for the what I had a client many years ago, um, who was agoraphobic for thirty years, um, which is a long time. And so obviously, naturally, they completely forgot what wouldn't know I'd, I'd, what to do when they weren't yeah. anxious. And I'm like, well, I'm doing the exposures, but like, I don't know. It's like, right. Ideally, what would you like to do just day to day? And we literally sat and wrote a, a plan, a journal. Every 10 minutes, we spent two sessions writing this, this, this plan out. Monday, get up at this time, go mm. and do this, go and do that. Even to the point where in the supermarket it was like that, oh, I'm going to go to that aisle and get that and get that and get that. Yeah. And we planned out the entire week. And it was brilliant because one, it was a, the brain was just doing some stuff that was completely out of routine and out of the norm. Mm-hmm. And also it, when there was no confusion, there's always something to anchor. So it was like, right, okay, this is so new to me, but my list says I'm going to go to the movies. So I'm going to go do that. And when yeah. I'm there, I'm going to get some popcorn and a drink and whatnot. And then, then I'm going to go see a friend. And then I'm going to ring a family member. And then I'm going to go and do something in the garden. And I'm going to do all these things because sometimes, and again, this is for the brave people doing exposures. And I don't, this is no way critical. But mm. how many people do you hear where it's like, they wake up, they just scan for their anxiety. They don't like the anxiety. It's always there. But I'm going to go do my exposure. And they bravely and courageously go and do an exposure. Um, you know, I've, I've walked through the park, didn't like mm-hmm. it. I've got intrusive thoughts, didn't like it. And they come home. Yeah, they feel a bit better. And then they just kind of sink back into the same habits again. They right. think like the thing of the exposure is going to be the thing that gets rid of the anxiety altogether at all times, like right. a magic wand. And none of what you're doing in between the exposures is important as well. Are you living your life? And that could just be as simple as, you know, watching TV having a bath, reading a book, pretty much avoiding the main compulsion that every person with anxiety has, and that's inwards scanning and rumination. Yeah, you're right. I think, and those exposures, that exposure, the exposure thing does fit into this identity question too, because I think in the beginning, we're manufacturing tasks, like exposures are manufactured tasks. They simulate what life looks like, but we're generally manufacturing them. They're not naturally natural, right? And what we're doing is taking basically a chisel and a hammer and we're, we're driving the exposure into your identity to crack it open, but it's artificial. And at oh, yeah. some point, yeah. Right. Oh, and at well, some like point, that. yeah. So at some point the exposure will break the sheen of the identity as, or, or the crust. Then at some point it's not always just about exposure. Then life itself becomes part of the process. 
You've got to yeah. find your gooey center. <laughs> <laughs> You do have yeah. to find your gooey center. That's yeah, true. You've got to find, if there's one thing to learn from this, we'll forget about this episode one day and someone yeah. will write in and be like, I found my gooey it's center. Gooey center. Like, oh, like, excuse me, who is this? This, this is, is disgusting. It seems inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need an adult. I need an adult. Uh, so, so. Oh, my gooey center. Yeah. But, I, yeah, but that's crack, part of crack it. open the shell, find yeah, the gooey center. Find the gooey what center. Is that so, about? Like, you yeah. let yourself start to sort of ooze out a little bit and try different things. These silly guitars that are behind me in every video. Just continuing it. He's yeah. just oozing out now. Oozing yeah. out. Just, these guitars oozed out of my gooey center because <laughs> after after Rhea, this is so ridiculous, but uh, after Rhea, my old therapist, and she's lovely, I, I, I still dig her, but she said, go to Starbucks, and I was my mind was blown. I remember being out one day, and I think I was going to get the mail, and I drove past the music store. It unfortunately doesn't exist anymore. I'm, like, I'm going to buy a guitar. I'm going to try that. I don't know oh. shit about playing the guitar, and I don't have that guitar anymore, but this just... And I'm still not good by any stretch of the imagination, but I enjoy this. And it became a part of what I like in life just because she told me to just try something. I don't know. Try anything. It doesn't matter. Maybe you'll hate it. And I remember thinking, I guess I could always sell it if I hate it. That guitar I purchase it. is such a beautiful symbol, isn't it? If I played better, it would be more of a beautiful symbol. <laughs> <laughs> no, but Stephen, that just, just you opting to, to let go of that part of the identity. Yeah. This is what non-anxious me would do right now. Yeah. And I got my guitar, and I—that's just a lot. I love those moments. I'm really quite soft and sentimental like that. Yeah. So when so when you do something that's like, my anxious brain doesn't want me to do this. My threat response doesn't want me to do this. But somewhere in the distance, mm -hmm. there's a version of me on Recovery Island who's waving, saying, "I'm playing a guitar over here, so go yeah. get one. Go get one." Um, and yeah, and I thought, oh yeah, like, and if that applies to you, and that could be anything. It, it can be anything. little things as well. Like yeah. Just yeah, go into the shop, buying a snickers bar or whatever you know like it's little things like that they mount up i find more joy in the little things as a therapist when my clients come in and be like, i did the little things here i did that and that, that, that rather than you know oh yeah i you know i climbed a skyscraper and punched a pigeon and then skydove off but then spent six days <laughs> ruminating and compulsing in my room well then i'm a bit like well what who are that's an amazing achievement yeah. Don't hurt animals, by the way. But uh, that was an amazing achievement. But I want to know what's happening in the nooks and crannies and the spaces between that. You know, because you yeah, could but... argue that actually you, that's at a very kind of left field level mm. that doing grand massive exposures and then kind of returning to base and waiting and doing more grand massive exposures is still perpetuating the identity that anxiety is part of you. Right, right. If, if that makes any sense. It does make sense. And I think changing your identity away from that of an anxious person is something that happens in small steps, you know, from the bottom up. It's a grassroots thing. It doesn't happen because I haven't gone more than a mile away from home and I went on vacation to Disneyland. That's great. That's a tremendous accomplishment. But what it's really, you don't live your life in Disneyland every day. You live your life minute by minute doing mundane shit. And you got to get back to doing that. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 It's, the, it's that subtle, let's get poetic. It's the, it's the decision to leave that bottle of water at home for a lot, for a walk. Oh man. Yeah. You didn't, yeah. that's that, that subtle choice. Like I don't need that bottle of water. Don't need the magic candy. Yeah. I just, I'm going to go on a walk. And even though it's the same walk I do every day, I'm doing it as someone where anxiety isn't my identity. Right. And, so, you know, if I want some water, I'll go to the shop and buy some water if I'm thirsty. Yeah. You know, uh, whereas the anxious person where it's part of their identity is, well, I better make sure I have that bottle of water just in case something bad happens. Or I'll just be thirsty. for Yeah, yeah. And, or I'll just be thirsty. Yeah, even I even more important. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah just, I'll, I'll just be thirsty. And, um, yeah, that's so, so subtle as opposed to the guy who climbed the skyscraper and jumped off. Yeah, I mean, that's impressive. Yeah. But there's more subtlety, you know, more power in the subtlety in between, in the little moments where, you know, I'm doing this because I'm me, not because I subscribe to the fact that I am an anxious person. And don't get me wrong, that's your right. If you just, if you want to call yourself an anxious person, that's also great. What do you think about that, Drew? Like if you, some people just find comfort in that, and that's fine. Yeah. I, oh, I, I, I'm, my copper has something to say about that. Um, <laughs> I, I think, I, I don't disagree with that. I always say, you know, you can choose, dude. Sorry, guys. Uh, 
you can choose whatever identity you want. Everybody's allowed to make their choices. And I wouldn't, it's not up to me to decide who you want to be. That's totally fine. So if you want to be an anxious person, go ahead. I literally would think nothing less of that because everybody gets to make their own choices. Same. Absolutely. Yeah. Same. I'm just, just talking it from a, from, from that perspective, from again, from being, you know, we've gone through the tunnel. We're out on, out on recovery Island. Yeah. We're saying this is how we got there. And this is how we like to live our life. But if you want to live your life in, and you're in the realms of your own comfort, that's super important too. You know, there's no, we don't want to come across as kind of sanctimonious. Well, that's too late for that. But like, kind of, we don't want to come across as like, you know, this is the only way and this is the way. No, some people are just quite happy with that. I've got a family member who's, who just likes, doesn't really leave the county that they live in or the, the state if you're an American. They just never leave the state because they're just quite happy doing that. You know, it scares them. They don't want to do it. And yet they live quite, you know, live very happy life. You know, it, it's, we're just talking from the perspective of, of our experiences and, mm. and maybe some collective experiences along the way. Yeah. The one thing we spent a minute or two on before we wrap up is. <laughs> Cop is like, I vehemently disagree like, with I vehemently this disagree absolute with that. bile. That is not okay. <laughs> Tell that, that limey Brit to shut up. Um, I think the other thing that I think sometimes people get stuck in identity wise is a bit of anger. So if you have adopted the persona of the angry, anxious person who must carry the mantle of the anxious and, and gain awareness and understanding and make people understand that this is difficult for us and you must be nice to us and accommodate us and know what we're going through. What happens if you're not the anxious person anymore? Sometimes for some people, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing, activism or social justice work, whatever you want to call it, it's not a bad thing. But I mm. find that some people literally get so caught up in carrying the mantle of the cause and, and making sure that we're not anxious people are not marginalized or, you know, subject to that sort of thing, <clears throat> that if you give up that identity, what happens? What's your cause? That can happen too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's a good point as well. Um, yeah, using that anger and um, that's when I'd honestly t uh, tell them to take that to kind of conventional therapy and be like, why? Why, why is this? Where's this sense of injustice? Kind of, yeah. Don't get me wrong. Just you can, if, if you just genuinely feel a sense of injustice and you want to carry that mantle, that's fine. But just make sure that your relationship with it is 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 okay. Yeah. Um, or oh, just uh, something I wanted to add as well before we wrap up. Like, sure. just be careful in terms of kind of when you look. And I know it's something I've banged on about before, or something like that. But like, this is why you know when you when you're seeking help and things like that. Just be careful you don't join like cults and things. Mm. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. You know, come to our secret WhatsApp group. Don't do it. Yeah, don't do it. It's it. I let's speculate here. If I joined a WhatsApp group during my recovery, I mean WhatsApp wasn't made then. Yeah. But if I joined a WhatsApp group during my recovery, I would not have recovered. And my phone would be going off every ten minutes, just reminded of the perils. And yes, it's a supportive network, but I'm also being reminded of how difficult anxiety can be. Yeah. I'm more likely to post and something to ask a reassurance just because of the nature of of anxiety disorders is that when we, you know, we're more, but like you're more likely to review a restaurant when they give you shit service as opposed to, you know, that was all right. Uh, you know, uh, it's the same. It's like you're more likely to kind of communicate, you know, this. I, does anyone else do this? I'm scared. You know, I've had this tingling feeling, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and that it has literally embedded itself as a reminder that, you know, this is your identity now. So yeah. I'm talking things like healing circles. Mm hmm um um and things like when I mean, there's other ones i won't tr name drop on your yeah. podcast but you know like no, i get come it come and join the recovery circle um, that, yes that, yeah. <laughs> it's a mentorship group you know yeah that's why like, your group's great because it's so well moderated and uh, uh, and healthy and i see so many hot but the, but i'm sorry but your group is one of the rare groups, yeah. <laughs> groups where they... one of the funniest things you've ever said to me is not like your group where you have guards on the towers like <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and i thought oh he's not wrong um yeah. uh, you still yeah. won't have my memes though i'm gonna keep posting those memes <laughs> we wait yeah. for your memes it's been a while yeah yeah i'm gonna have to uh, yeah let's gonna post some memes of the anxious truth 
you know, insulting the admin team. And then if you don't approve them, it's because anxiety has become your identity. Get That's over. exactly right. Because we're <laughs> bastards. Yeah, I get it. So. Anyway. No, no you're they, right. do you're a, they do a really good job and uh, fair play to you. It's really good. Well, we try. We try. But thanks, man. I appreciate that. All right. Well, thanks for coming by. It's a great discussion. We'll do it again sometime. Yeah, Just we don't do this that. enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm gonna, are you going to come on season three of the Panic Pod? Hell yeah. We'll talk about whatever you want. Yeah. Uh, last one we did was on holiday anxiety, which is really fun, actually. Yeah. And we were, reca- we were recounting loads. I got really good feedback from it and just recounting our own experiences from like going away and stuff. But yeah, we'll do, we'll, I, I'm going to do more of those, you know, kind of specific anxieties. Obviously, we talk about the same, you know, go on the same theories. Yeah. But yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Sounds good. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. Anytime. Next time you give me the usual 30 minute notice, I'll roll it a better early on Saturday. Yeah, that's amazing. We yeah. did that one like in like 15 minutes. Like, hey, you're around? Sure. Yeah. I scratch yeah. My head. And it was, it was brilliant. Yeah, good. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Anyway. All right. Thanks, Ken. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very I'll much. Check on the screen here so that you guys, I, I'll be back in a minute anyway to wrap it up like I usually do. I'll give you all Josh's links and everything. But if you want to find Josh, just search for Anxiety Josh. You will find him. He's out there. Yeah. And it's right. not part of my identity, apparently. No, it is not. Okay. We are back in the studio. Josh is off and doing the rest of his day in the UK. I'm here in New York. Let me just wrap this up really quickly. I think that was a great, great conversation about a topic that we might not cover a lot. Yes, I've covered it on the Anxious Morning pod, uh, the Anxious Morning Newsletter and Podcast. I'll put links in the show notes to that if you want to check it out. But this was a little bit softer, more human, humanistic approach to the topic that I think probably needs to be brought up now and then because it's one of those sneaky parts of recovery and anxiety that we, we kind of miss sometimes. Anyway, so thanks again to Josh for taking the time. It's always a pleasure to have him on the podcast and to work with him. We'll definitely be doing more as we go forward. That is episode 235 in the book, so you know it's over because the music, right? This is Afterglow by my friend Ben Drake. It is the song that you hear at the beginning most of the time, but always at the end of every podcast episode. You can find more about Ben and his music at bendrakemusic.com. If you go check him out, tell him I said hello. If you are listening to The Anxious Truth on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or some platform that lets you leave a rating and a review, then leave us a five-star rating if you dig the podcast. And if you really dig the podcast, take five minutes and write a review because it helps more people find the podcast. And then more people get this information and hopefully the help that they need. Thank you very much for that. If you're watching as a YouTube video, then why are you not subscribed to my channel? You should do that. You should hit the like button on this video. You should hit this, the notification bell so that you know when I upload new episodes. And you can leave a comment. I promise I will sleep th- sweep through every couple of days on YouTube and make sure I answer everybody's comments. I love when you guys interact. I'm happy to do it. And that is it. I hope you found this episode helpful. I will be back again next week with another podcast episode. I do not know what I'm going to be talking about as usual, but I will be here. And remember, until then, this is the way. You got the feeling that you're going to win. Yeah, you're doing fine. Now in the city and you're living fast No looking back or dwelling on the past You know you'll never get another chance To go and live your life